Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Voices of the Western Slope, programming that is sponsored by the Grand Mesa Arts and Events Center and the Delta County Libraries. Tonight you're going to see Flocks and Rocks, a presentation by Dr. David Null. We actually had this scheduled as a live event last March, but we all know what happened to everything last March. So we wanted to be sure before the cranes come back, you got to see it again. And we did it as a virtual event so everyone can see it. We hope you enjoy tonight's show. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Dave No. I'm with uh, Colorado Detours, a guided tour company based out of Paonia, Colorado. And tonight I'd like to share with you uh, some uh, relationships uh, between a type of bird that regularly visits Western Colorado and the topography and the geology in the area. Let's jump right to the slideshow here. Because I know that you want to see it. Thank you for joining me tonight. The name of tonight's presentation is Flocks and Rocks. And it's the true story of Sandhill Cranes and Fruit Growers Reservoir in Western Colorado. First, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Colorado Geological Survey. I worked for the CGS for years and mapped a lot of areas of Western Colorado for the geology. This has given me the background to give tonight's talk. I'd also like to thank my sponsors, the Grand Mesa, Arts and Events Center in Cedar Edge and the Delta County Libraries. Uh, two really great organizations and I've done talks for them before. I always enjoy it. Uh, if you're members of those, uh, I certainly thank you for, for your support. If you're not members, uh, I suggest that uh, you look into them and uh, we thank you for your support of these organizations. I also want to give some special thanks to Bruce Ackerman and, and Judith Lopez. Uh, both of them are members of the Black Canyon Audubon Society, and they fixed me up with some really nice crane photos uh, that were taken out in this area. So first, let's just start out. It is such a pleasure to be out in uh, the wild or out on a farm or anywhere outdoors and hear the sandhill cranes coming in. Um, and you may hear them before you even see them. Sometimes they're so far up in the sky that you can't even see the bodies flying around, but you can hear them. The sound travels for miles. Up close, uh, they're magnificent birds. They're big and uh, it's just fun to see them in the fields as they turn around and they show you all the different views and uh, make all their sounds. Uh, it's really an experience to watch these birds. And you don't have to look too far to see their evidence in Western Colorado. Uh, they're the um, kind of moniker of the town of Orchard City. And if you take a look at the signs for Orchard City, you see that there's a sandhill crane uh, right there, along with some apples and uh, some water. So tonight we're gonna look at two interrelated questions. One is why is Fruit Growers Reservoir here in the first place? And then uh, why are the cranes here as well? And why did they go to Fruit Growers Reservoir? So first let's take a look at Fruit Growers Reservoir. Uh, I just call it an odd little reservoir uh, tucked in a valley in Western Colorado. And here's what we've got. This is the location map showing all of Colorado with Denver near the center of it. Out near the west is Grand Junction and near Grand Junction is Grand Mesa. That's that feature that we're pointing to. Zooming in a little closer, Grand Mesa is elevated to nearly 12,000 feet above sea level and on its southern flank is Cedar Edge and just south of Cedar Edge right there is Fruit Growers Reservoir between Cedar Edge and Delta, Colorado. Here's a picture of it using Google Maps, Fruit Growers Reservoir and it's in an area called Hearts Basin. And what I want to show you is it's separated. Hearts Basin is an isolated kind of dead-end basin 
Uh, the Surface Creek Valley is to the west of it, on the left there, and then on the right is the Valley of Current Creek. Those are creeks that flow down from Grand Mesa, and the water bypasses uh, Hart's Basin. Now, why do we have a reservoir there in the first place? Well, it doesn't generate its own water. We have to bring water in from Grand Mesa. And so one of the places is from uh, Current Creek, and it comes via the Dry Creek Transfer Ditch into the valley. Now, the other place it comes from is the Alfalfa Ditch, and the Alfalfa Ditch comes from Surface Creek, uh, right below Cedar Edge, Colorado, and it's, it's brought through a gap in the hills and then down into this dead-end basin called Hart's Basin. There is a dam at the lower end of the reservoir, and that's what allows the reservoir to fill up as much as it does. So Fruit Growers Reservoir, there's a picture of it from the dam and a couple of factoids for you. It was built in the very last of the 19th century, rebuilt in 1939, and we'll talk to you a little while uh, later about why it had to be rebuilt. Uh, it's about two miles long uh, when the reservoir is filled and about three quarters of a mile wide. It stores just a little over 4,500 acre feet of water. Its elevation is just a little more than a mile high and it's 476 acres in size. Downstream, this reservoir was built to uh, irrigate farmlands near the Gunnison River and it irrigates nearly 3,000 acres of land. The geology of Hart's Basin is quite interesting as well. Uh, this is from a map that I created of the Orchard City area and Hart's Basin is right in the middle of it. I'm going to point at it with my pointer right there so you can see where Fruit Growers Reservoir is. And uh, a lot of the area around here is what we call the adobes. It's the Manco Shale, uh, which is a Cretaceous Age formation. It used to be the bottom of a shallow sea and it was created from mud. And so mud turned into rocky shale. There's a lot of Manco Shale uh, out beyond uh, and we call it the adobes around here. Hart's Basin is also filled with Manco Shale. There isn't any gravel in the bottom of the basin. So it's a shale-filled basin. And to the side, it's flanked. Uh, there are some higher mesas, higher gravel-capped mesas, like Antelope Hill, which uh, we've shown a circle in red around the, the, the label for it, and Cedar Mesa which is off to the northwest. Uh, so it's in sconce, kind of tucked in behind those high mesas. Also uh, to the northwest, which is over this way, is the Surface Creek Mesa. That's what Cedar Edge and Orchard City are built upon. Uh, those gravels come down an ancient valley and they bypass, for the most part, uh, this Hearts Basin area. We'll look at that relationship a little later. Uh, but what we have is a shale-filled valley surrounded by gravel-capped mesas and gravel-capped surfaces. And so we talked about the adobes in the Manco Shale. Here's a picture of them. And uh, one thing that uh, you can see here is there's not a lot of vegetation in this. It is a badlands area uh, created of shale. There's not naturally very much water in it if we're away from the streams coming from Grand Mesa. Now, when we contrast that with the picture of the reservoir, uh, you can see a big difference. And so what we've been able to do here is change the ecosystem just by bringing the water into the reservoir. So the difference between Fruit Growers Reservoir and the surrounding area is that all of a sudden we've got an abundant water source for at least part of the year. And you can see how green and lush that area is around the lake. Let's look at cranes for a little bit. Uh, we're gonna go a different direction now and look at how old are cranes anyway. This would be called paleontology when we go older than history. And so, one of the best pieces of crane information in the whole uh, North American continent comes from Nebraska. 
and it's at a place called Ashfall Fossil Beds. It's a uh, state park, and it's got some great fossils up there. And uh, those fossils were formed about 12 and a half million years ago when volcanoes went off, just like in this picture, and uh, created a cloud of ash that killed a lot of animals, and those became fossils. And uh, cranes are part of those. Here's a couple of pictures of fossils that were found um, at the ash beds. And these are both cranes uh, in various uh, positions. They were living animals and then they got buried in the volcanic ash and died. And what the researchers at University of Nebraska at Lincoln have discovered is that this is a crowned crane. Now, mostly those are found in Africa these days, but it's a close relative to the Sandhill cranes. And they've created this nice uh, diorama here of what it might have looked like uh, just about the time that the ash fall came and uh, killed all these different animals, rhinoceroses, horses, camels, uh, all sorts of different things, dinotheriums, uh, all these wild animals running around. But you can see in their diorama from the State Museum, there are the cranes in the background. So they recognize that the cranes were part of the ecosystem in Nebraska at that time, 12 and a half million years ago. And before that, here's a modern crane here with its young, which are called calves. And uh, they look downright prehistoric in a way, and they make all these kind of prehistoric sounds. Uh, some of the research that goes back has linked them to this critter right here called Ergolornis. And this was something that existed about 35 to 40 million years ago uh, in Eurasia. So they feel like cranes uh, arose in the Eurasian continent and then spread throughout the world. Now look at the uh, wings on that. It's a flightless bird and, uh, you know, kind of like an ostrich and things like that. Um, but it, it is uh, related to limpets, cranes. Uh, there's kind of a common ancestry uh, that this Ergolornis sprung out uh, different species from. And these days it's kind of interesting. I've found that, that uh, people who study dinosaurs are recognizing more and more that there's a strong link between birds of today and the dinosaurs of yesteryear they're starting to think that a lot of the dinosaurs uh, actually had feathers. Uh, some of them had wings, they had plumage, uh, they had displays like the modern birds would. And uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting books like this one that are out there now, A Field Guide to Mesozoic Birds and Other Winged Dinosaurs. Notice that they call the birds and the dinosaurs the same, uh, which is probably uh, the truth. So there's some really exciting research going on now. Uh, probably uh, someday there will be some research into Ergolornis that takes it into even um, older and older types of dinosaurs. Very exciting. Now, notable crane fossils. Let's take a look at this. We just talked about the Ergolornis. The oldest crane fossils recognized in the world are from Eurasia, and they date back to the late Eocene, which is about 40 to 35 million years ago. In North America, uh, we just showed you the Ashfall fossil beds, Miocene age 12 million years ago. And then the oldest for sure sandhill crane fossil that's been identified is in Florida. This is from the Pleistocene period, 2.5 million years ago. Now, what was going on in Western Colorado at that time? At the time of the oldest crane fossils, that was the time that the West Elk Mountains and the San Juan Mountains were being formed from volcanoes and lacoliths um, about 35 million years ago. That's pretty old and Colorado was uh, just forming in Western Colorado at that time. Now, when the ash, ash fall fossil beds were being formed during the Miocene, that is just about the time the Grand Mesa was first being formed by basalt flows. Uh, Grand Mesa was a valley at that time. The flow spread over the top of it, and now it's the highest point of, on the landscape because of 
uh, erosion that's taken place in the last 10 million years. But there were cranes around in North America when Grand Mesa was being formed. And then uh, the oldest for sure sandhill crane fossils at about that time, the landscape was still higher than it was today. And it was at the level of today's Oak Mesa, which is to the east of uh, Cedar Edge, uh, but is quite high above the valley. And during that time, there were sandhill cranes in North America. And when you kind of take a look at sandhill cranes or just cranes in general, um, as far as the lifeline that goes back into evolution, they are the oldest living birds on earth, which kind of explains why they're so weird and creaky and make all these strange dinosaur sounds. Um, they really are our, our strongest and longest link into the past. So now that we know something about cranes and their history, let's see what the sandhill cranes are doing today. Let's go on a journey and follow this uh, migration that they have between their wintering grounds, which here in this map are shown as blue, and then their nesting grounds, their breeding grounds, which are shown in the reds. In between are the migration routes, and the cranes will migrate twice a year um, up to the northern part of North America. There are different populations of cranes, and the crane, the population uh, that we're interested in is called the Rocky Mountain population of greater sandhill cranes. It's a real mouthful, but what it means is that there is one part of the species uh, that lives down in Mexico and up into New Mexico during the winter time, and then they fly up to places in northern Utah into Wyoming and Idaho, Montana, and up into Canada to do their breeding during the summer. And they are flying right up the Rio Grande Valley and then through Colorado on their way up during the spring. There's about 18,500 birds in this population uh, that does vary year to year because of how uh, the winter has gone, predation and the general health of the population. And then uh, all of them stage in the San Luis Valley, uh, just to the south of us during the spring migration. So it's kind of a funnel. They all come up to the San Luis Valley and then they disperse a little bit when they go to the north. Here's a Google map that shows uh, the Rio Grande Valley to the south. Monta Vista National Wildlife Area and the San Luis Valley here. And then the Grays Lake Natural wildlife area in Idaho. And so uh, all of the cranes start down to the south, they go to Monta Vista, they disperse a little bit, but an awful lot of them go up to Gray's Lake. And we'll take a look at this red uh, star. And that is um, our area, that is Fruit Growers Reservoir. So you can see that it's right along the way. And there goes the main flyway up toward Gray's Lake. Let's look at it a little closer, Monta Vista down here in the lower right, Gray's Lake up in the top there, and Fruit Growers Reservoir conveniently located right along that flyway. Now about 50% of the Rocky Mountain population stages at Fruit Growers Reservoir, so maybe about 9,000 birds off and on. That's a lot of birds to be coming in at one time into one little area, so uh, it is kind of a big event as far as bird migrations go out in this part of Colorado. Here's another view of it, and what I'd like to show you is why the birds may funnel through fruit growers I'm drawing some yellow lines here, and they go around the higher peaks in the Colorado Rockies. And you can see that there's a gap right there between Monta Vista and Fruit Growers Reservoir. Would cranes like to fly up that way? They sure would. And it's about 140 miles. So uh, most of the cranes that stop at Fruit Growers for the night have started in Monta Vista that morning. Now, another view of it, just kind of looking at, at uh, that flyway between Monta Vista and Fruit Growers Reservoir, one thing the cranes like to do is take off and then fly as high as they can and then spend the rest of the day kind of shooting in lower and lower until the end of the day. So uh, they'll fly from Monta Vista, fly pretty high, and what they have to get 
over the top of here is Mesa Mountain, which is almost 13,000 feet tall. Uh, they could go around to the right a little bit, but that would be the crane's flight for the day when they come into fruit growers. So now that they've reached fruit growers reservoir, let's kind of take a look at uh, what's going on here. Why did the cranes come here? Well, they like it. There's a lot of things that are very conducive to the cranes having a safe stop uh, at the foot of Grand Mesa and Fruit Growers Reservoir. And one is that they uh, can go to a shallow water roosting site. Fruit Growers Reservoir is very shallow, so there's a large area of shallows uh, that goes out into the water. The cranes like to wade out at night, like in that upper left picture, and be uh, safe and away from coyotes and dogs and other types of things. And so uh, they love the upper reaches of Fruit Growers Reservoir because they can all go out into those shallows and wade. There's adjacent habitat and forage, and so the cranes love to go out in the fields. Uh, they'll actually fly out and feed for a little bit before they go out uh, about their business. And uh, there are farm fields around in that area. And then finally, uh, it is somewhat of a wildlife area out there. There's minimal human disturbance uh, right around that reservoir, and they like that. So let's take another look at uh, Fruit Growers Reservoir. And we looked before at what brings the water into the reservoir. Uh, those two ditches right there, alfalfa and dry creek transfer, um, come out into the shallows there and they create quite a great habitat for the cranes. It's a wetlands area. Uh, there are ducks and other types of things uh, going around there. So there's a lot of wildlife that likes it. Uh, in addition, there's another source that I've found from doing my geologic mapping, and that would be from Surface Creek, uh, not as a ditch, but as groundwater flow. And so Surface Creek area is formed of gravels, and some of those gravels come around the front of some mountains and into the fruit growers reservoir area. Groundwater flowing through those gravels comes in as well. And so I'm going to mark the path of it right here, and it would come into that western edge of Fruit Growers Reservoir to create even more wetlands along that side. Again, very conducive to the birds. Now here's a geologic map that shows that. Fruit Growers Reservoir is in the center. Here's Hart's Basin with all the shale in the bottom. That doesn't bring in very much water, but here are the gravels from the Surface Creek area with Cedar Edge up at the top and Orchard City there on the left. And I'll uh, click again, and there's the Surface Creek uh, gravels, Manco Shale over in the Hearts Basin area. And here comes that groundwater path around to the side and through the gravels into that western side of Fruit Growers Reservoir. Then when the cranes leave, uh, they are heading up to Idaho. That's that circle up at the top of this Google map image. Um, and there's that star showing um, Fruit Growers Reservoir once more. And there aren't very many mountains to get around there. There are the Uintas up in Utah shown in the yellow there, not too much of a problem. So they have a, a long flyaway to go to. Uh, there are some wetlands along the Green River along the way and the Great Bear Lake. So uh, they've got some great places to go. But the first thing that they have to do is get out of Fruit Growers Reservoir and they have to go over the fearsome Grand Mesa. They have a, a really high mountain to go over right when they start out. Here's a picture of the reservoir during the spring. And uh, you can see that this time of the year, snowstorms, um, all sorts of snow accumulating, clouds, storms. Uh, they've got a little bit of flying to do, a little bit of trickery to go up to the north and get on their way. Now here's another Google map image in 3D. Fruit Growers Reservoir there on the right in Hearts Basin. And here is an outline of the top of Grand Mesa at almost 11,000 feet. And there is the top. Those are the old lava flows. So they have to fly from the reservoir and get over the top of that thing. And how do they do that? How does the land, how does the geology help them to get up in the air? 
And so here is where they get helped. Remember all those adobes we talked about around the outside edge of Fruit Growers Reservoir. That is a hot land with very little water. Uh, it's a great place for thermal currents to rise out of. And so uh, I've seen the cranes flying over that way and then they circle and they go higher and higher and higher. Finally, they get up above 12,000 feet and they're able to continue along their way to the north. And there they go. They're going higher and higher in that picture. And pretty soon they'll just be specks in the sky and arrivederci. They'll go away. Uh, new cranes will fly in the next night. Um, and by the way, you can see that on a web page. If you go to look at the Eckert Crane Days web page, uh, they do a, a nightly count. And so you can figure out when there's a lot of cranes coming in and go out and see them take off the next morning. Now, let's take a look at an event along Fruit Growers Reservoir. I told you that it was rebuilt in 1939. And so there was a day that the reservoir drained and it all washed away. And I became aware of this when I was doing my geologic mapping and I walked into Faye's Cafe down in um, Austin to eat lunch one day. And the uh, proprietor there, Rufus Miller, he had all these pictures underneath the counter, underneath the glass, and he allowed me to take pictures of them and use them in my publication. And he told me the whole backstory of the day the dam broke at Fruit Growers Reservoir. So let's take a look at what happened. It was uh, June 13th, 1937. Uh, it was a banner year for runoff, and the reservoir became filled with runoff. And um, let me see if I can go back a picture. Yeah, there's the reservoir, there's the dam. Uh, the reservoir became filled to the brim and there was no spillway around the dam. So that water had no place to go but over the top of the dam and it started wearing it away. Um, they got people out. Uh, this was in 1937 and they started digging a trench on the left side of this picture uh, to try to drain the reservoir. It didn't work and the reservoir uh, actually just broke through the dam and uh, all that water spilled out and went down the valley. And where did it go? It went down a valley called Alfalfa Run. If you look at Alfalfa Run today, the bottom of it is near the Gunnison River, and it's the little town of Austin, Colorado. That's where the wall of water from this reservoir went. Uh, what is very fortunate about this event is that uh, the dam operators were able to get on the phone and call down ahead. So the population um, of Austin, all the school kids and all that kind of stuff, Everybody went out of their houses and went up the hill, and then they watched the flood water hit their town. And what happened geologically is that it carried a slurry of sand, gravel, mud, and gigantic boulders down the valley. And those washed into town and created an alluvial fan where that valley ended and uh, the flood flows fanned out over the floodplain of the Gunnison River. Now those did a couple of things uh, to the town, washing the boulders in. Um, the boulders washed in and they knocked a lot of the houses off their foundations and ruined several houses. Um, and then the floodwaters dissipated fairly quickly after that, but it really changed the nature of the town. Look at all those boulders in the upper left hand picture there. It was crazy. Now, if you want to go see evidence of it today, just go drive around the little town of Austin and you will see that people are decorating their yard with boulders. And if you go down around the, the blocks by the post office there, there are gigantic boulders here and there scattered around town. Those are all from that 1937 event. So now that we've seen uh, Fruit Growers Reservoir, which was built back again in 1939 and has been around since then, let's take a look a little deeper back in time. And uh, when we look around the Gunnison Gorge today, we find evidence of the peoples that were there uh, before, the Ute Indian tribes and, and their ancestors. 
uh, were in this area and they created records of their being there. And so a good question is, uh, were there cranes there at that time for them to see? We know that the Sandhill cranes have been around for about two and a half million years in North America. What were the ancient peoples in this area seeing? And we don't have much evidence from Colorado, but all we have to do is go into Utah and we will see that there is evidence in petroglyphs of uh, cranes that were seen by the um, indigenous peoples there. This is a place called Nine Mile Wash. It's over by Price, Utah. And this is a panel of petroglyphs here. And up at the very top, there are two cranes uh, depicted there. And I'm going to zoom in on that picture a little bit. Uh, very obvious crane forms. You don't see very much in the way of wings. And you see the long legs and the long beaks. It looks like there's a duck and a snake and some other things around in there. There's also a very curious line in between the two cranes. Uh, it makes me wonder whether the cranes are doing the limbo with the duck going underneath the limbo stick, but uh, we really don't know what those cranes were doing for sure, and we don't know what that line is between the cranes. A lot of mystery there. Uh, another mystici mysterious place is in Butler Wash, which is farther in southeast Utah. And there are a couple of panels there that show very crane-like birds. Here's one of them. This is called the uh, Wolfman panel, uh, which could very well be some kind of creation story, something like that. Uh, the crane is right there, and there's a duck next to it. Uh, and the way that the rock has weathered there, we don't see the bottom, so we don't see the long legs of the crane. Uh, close by is a place called the Big Crane Panel, and that one does show the whole crane form there uh, with a sun-like object that's next to it. So cranes um, appear to be part of the creation story of the peoples that are there, and it's also part of some epic poetry in the Zunai tradition. So were there cranes there uh, when the first peoples were around? And this gives us evidence to say that there was. Uh, these are from the back basket maker um, uh, era. And so that was about 1,000 to 500 years ago uh, that uh, these were being recorded by the peoples. But we could go back even farther to the first peopling of the area and, and just try to wonder what it was like out there and uh, if they would have seen cranes in that area. Now, about 12,000 years ago uh, was the last big glaciation in Colorado from the Ice Ages. And this is a map of most of Colorado. And it shows uh, where the glaciers were uh, up in the high mountains of Colorado. And what I'm going to uh, kind of highlight right here is Grand Mesa. Grand Mesa had an ice cap over the top of it. Um, and so it was covered with ice. But even at that time that the ice cap was there, uh, the first peopling in Colorado uh, that we know of at least is recorded just to the south in our area in a place called Eagle Rock Shelter. I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures of that shelter. It is at the bottom of a rock face in the Gunnison River Gorge. And uh, so it was an overhanging shelter. Uh, there has been a, an archeological dig that's been going on over there for um, about 12 years ago. It was started uh, Dr. Dudley Gardner of uh, Western Wyoming Community College uh, was the lead investigator and Glade Haddon with the BLM uh, was his partner in that. This is a picture of some of the fire pits that were shown. As they dug deeper and deeper using student help, uh, they encountered uh, new pieces of evidence of uh, inhabitation, fire pits, um, all sorts of things like mats, uh, yucca sandals, the second oldest uh, shoe found in North America is coming from here. And it was found to be 13,000 years old. Uh, although we don't see it in the petroglyphs that are in this area, it is certainly possible that the people in this area were witnessing cranes as part of their annual migration. 
Now, the interesting thing about the migratory cranes in Western Colorado is that they don't stop at Fruit Growers Reservoir during the fall. And you might think that that's kind of odd until you consider this. Fruit Growers is made as an irrigation reservoir. And so that water is used during the summertime. If we take a look at a Google map image, uh, Google Earth image, excuse me, that's uh, taken in June, you can see that the reservoir is filled all the way up the valley. That's when the cranes show up. If we take a look at an image shot in August at the end of the growing season, um, we take a look, this is a split picture, so really I wanna focus on the upper end of the reservoir. That is a dry reservoir right there. So it affords the cranes no protection. Uh, there's no standing water, there's no frogs and things like that to eat. And so there's really no reason for the cranes to stop uh, on their flight over Grand Mesa going to the south at that time. Now a new wrinkle that we have in the area, is that we've got a growing winter population of sandhill cranes. So the fun doesn't end with the uh, spring migration that comes through with thousands and thousands of birds, but there is a population of several thousand birds, and probably from what we see, it looks like it's growing at this time. And so uh, they will show up, in about October or so, and they'll leave uh, around April uh, or March, just before the other cranes come in. And so it's quite possible to go into the Delta area, into the farmlands uh, downstream from town, and just drive around and look. And those cranes are living there for several months, and uh, they love going out in the fields and foraging during the day. They'll fly back to the river, the Gunnison River, at night. So uh, if you want to see cranes in the winter, go there. If you want to see them in the spring, go to Fruit Growers Reservoir in around March. So in summary, what have we learned today? Well, Fruit Growers Reservoir is only there because of the works of man. It was built for water diversion, and it was built in a very odd dead-end shale valley called Hart's Basin. Uh, the shale in the valley allows the water to stay and not infiltrate into the geology below, but they have to bring water diversions from Current Creek and from the Cedar Edge area. The Greater Sandhill Crane stop here, about half of the Rocky Mountain population. In the spring, because of the shallow water roosting sites, some really good habitat and forage nearby and minimal human disturbance. They don't stop here in the fall, however, because the reservoir is drained and there's really nothing to stop at. The restaurant is closed. And then finally, uh, we should say here that, that we can view another population of cranes during the winter time in the nearby Delta. So thank you very much. If you're interested in the Colorado Geological Survey, uh, geologic maps that I took part in making in Western Colorado, here is a map showing uh, those areas. They're quadrangle maps, just like the hiking maps. And they go from uh, Montrose up to Delta and over into the North Fork area. And you can get these by going on the Colorado Geological Survey website. Go to their online bookstore and search for the map names, and you can find those maps. If you want a paper map, they cost about $35, or you can get free digital maps uh, that you can download right onto your computer. And finally, I want you to remember crane days. Crane days didn't occur last year because of COVID, and it's not occurring this year as well. But two years ago, here are some of the uh, groups that participated in the crane days uh, with Delta County Tourism and the Black Canyon Audubon Society uh, taking the lead in some events and the Eckert Crane Days. Um, the cranes don't care about COVID. They'll come to the reservoir anyway. Um, but please uh, go out and watch them and watch for crane days occurring in the future. With that, I want to thank you for your kind attention. I'll get out of here now. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, just remember when you're out there to uh, appreciate the cranes and uh, the geology and the works of uh, people that are farmers that allow them to be there.
Thank you very much and have a good night. Please consider making a $10 donation to cover cost of this presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.